across America, thousands of home cooks think they have what it takes to be a master chef. But only the 40 best have been brought to the Master Chef Kitchen to go head to head for a white apron as they prove themselves to three of the food world's biggest names. Culinary legend Gordon Ramsay, renowned pastry chef Christina Tosi, and joining them this season, award-winning chef and restaurateur Aron Sanchez. Woo! They'll face challenges from the ocean's edge. Our lifeguards are arriving. To the top of the world. Oh my god, wilderness cooking. Shoot. They'll cook at five-star restaurants. Guys, hey, one omelet. And all-star destinations. The 50th anniversary of Caesar's Palace. They'll battle it out, creating dish after stunning dish. I think that is out of this world. To win the title of Master Chef. Hello. Oh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so tell us, where are we in the MasterChef season right now? So we're not quite halfway through. Uh, season eight, some incredible home cooks, a lot of personality, a lot of style, a lot of swagger. But they're still learning. They're still developing. The episode that's on tonight uh, is a really fun one because it's a little bit more targeted in what you learn as a professional chef. Uh, the episode starts out with um, a dinner that the home cooks have to prepare for uh, the master chef dining room that's full of purveyors, food purveyors, oh. farmers, um, nut purveyors, honey makers, bee growers, where they're really understanding the nuance of what a quality product is and not just what it is, but how to best prepare it to showcase it to the people that raised it, that farmed it, that grew it, and that brought it to the MasterChef kitchen before the home cooks used their creativity to put it to good use. So I feel like that's a really, it's a really fun one because it's one that you typically learn when you're on your way, <clears throat> pardon me, when you're on your way uh, in a real life professional kitchen and those that don't make the cut get a little pastry pressure test. Oh. Cannolis, my friend. <gasps> oh, cannolis. I love, I love a cannoli. You're going to Italy soon. Yep. Cannolis are like easily one of the most simple to enjoy pastries, but one of the most difficult to execute pastries. Have you ever been to Tremini Brothers in Philadelphia? No. Oh, it's in the Reading Terminal Market. It's this historic cannoli place. I grew up on them. It is the ultimate treat for me now. We've got to go on a road trip now. All right, deal. Yep. So Milk Bar is turning nine in November. Yes. I can't believe it's been nine years. Nine years. What do you hope to accomplish before you hit a decade? So... I, the thought that I've been building this like quirky American style bakery where my only goal nine years ago was just to open this bakery, to have it uh, be additive to the food world, to have it be just a fun place for people to stop by and have something that was different but still celebrated like the spirit of what makes a baked good so darn delicious. We have 12 stores now. We ship worldwide. We make wedding cakes. We have baking mixes in Target. Like, it's insane what we've been able to accomplish in nine years. Before, before this baby turns 10, like, I'm, I'm, I'm really pushing to take her on the road. I've found so many things in starting this business. Uh, being a pastry chef first, like evolving into a businesswoman has been incredible. I was raised by a businesswoman. She sent me to like college to become a businesswoman and I kind of always pushed it to the side. Um, coming into my own in that space has been incredible. And I'd say the most rewarding part about growing Milk Bar and what I'm really looking forward to in year nine and year 10 is creating jobs, is create, we have 280 people on our team at Milk Bar right now. Wow. And we're continuing to grow and being able to be this great, like outside of the box employer that provides incredible benefits, but that also is a place for personality and quirk and diversity. Um, it's kind of like the anti-job that can be your profession for the rest of your life. That for me has been like one of the most fulfilling things that I never saw coming. Just baking more cookies, feeding more people, you know, crack pie and cereal milk, ice cream and cake truffles. Um, I'm 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 gonna take Milk Bar on the road for sure, and I'm really excited about it. Two eighty. 
Oh. I know. I remember coming here when you only had the East Village location. I was visiting New York and got a bunch of cookies and ate them in my hotel room in bed <laughs> for my birthday. And that's it's one of my like form you live New York memories. I feel like, like Milk yeah. Bar has the spirit of New York because it's where I opened the first Milk Bar. But growing up in Ohio and growing up in Virginia and the D.C. area, I feel like the spirit of it is like rings so true in any city. But I love that New York is where you first found Milk Bar because it's where I first found Milk Bar. <laughs> Are there any other specific markets that you want to enter? Any other countries or cities that you dream about? Um, I'm really close on closing uh uh, closing my first round of fundraising to like really grow Milk Bar. At this point, nine years have only grown Milk Bar, like bootstrapping it, doing it like penny pinching everything I can with a great jumping off platform with uh, Dave Chang and the Momofuku group. Mm -hmm. And we're in DC right now, but we're going to continue to sort of like grow our reach and presence because that for me is like a little bit of a hometown uh, homecoming. Mm -hmm. um, we're in Vegas right now, but we're going to keep growing further west because we know where our customers are because we ship them cookies. They they order yeah. cookies online and we're like, we need to open a store near you rather than, I mean, I love, I love like a milk bar package arriving to someone's door, but um, definitely out west, more on the east coast. And then the big towns that we know already have like the milk bar spirit and the milk bar love that we're really excited to, to open up shop in. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love that. And you just premiered a new menu. Yeah, today Starting is today. menu change at Milk Bar. Yes, tell me about that. There's so, a cheeseburger bun. There's a cheeseburger <laughs> bomb. We, uh, we changed the menu at Milk Bar usually every quarter. It's always a little bit of a tricky thing because... We can never take the compost cookie off the menu. That's like a deal breaker. If the crack pie ever goes anywhere, if cereal milk, if birthday truffles, like Blueberries I and will. Cream better be safe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like people, you, and that's like the beauty of having a bakery that's known and loved in all of those ways. But so we're always, but we love to create. Like that's so much a part of who we are. Innovation is such a hallmark to Milk Bar. And so I'm constantly trying to like carve out little, like, you know, corners and areas of the menu to be able to create and innovate without taking away from people's favorites because that's what's fun about coming to Milk yeah. Bar. So we have um, a new soft serve flavor on starting today um, at all of our stores nationwide and it's kind of like a love letter to my favorite snacks, like afternoon snacks as a kid. One of them is like cinnamon bread. One of them is like white bread toasted with butter and cinnamon sugar. And then the other is just like a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch oh. cereal. All of those things into like this great creamy soft serve. It's epic. It's epic. Like I will just drink the base without it even being frozen. <laughs> That's how good it is. Um, and then we're changing up some of our savory offerings. Um, one is a spinach artichoke bomb. Like all of our breads are meant to be like, like I milk bars meant to be like a frenetic place full of energy and, and quirk. It's not meant to be like where you pull out your laptop and write your next like great American novel. And I love yeah. a good book. <laughs> yeah. So all of our breads are made to like grab and go. So we make these breads as bombs. The bread's on the outside, the filling's on the inside. So you can grab it and go on with your incredible life. One is a spinach artichoke bomb. It's basically like, uh, like what you would find in like middle America over the holidays, like spinach artichoke dip in a like dip. bread bowl of like caraway, caraway rye, but in a grab grab and go element. And then we have a cheeseburger bomb, which is, I've been eating a lot of cheeseburgers. It's been a great summer. This is a little love letter to the cheeseburger. It's not meant to like compete with your favorite cheeseburger, but man, is it awesome when you need your cheeseburger fix in a quick moment and you're on the you go. You can grab and go. And then candy bar pie is back on the menu, Ooh. which is like, um, which is a pie that we had on the menu when we first opened milk bar and comes on and off the menu. It's, a love letter to all of the best candy bars out there um, made from scratch layers of like chocolate crust and salted caramel and peanut butter nougat and pretzels and more chocolate. And it won't be on the menu for long, but oh. man, is it awesome while it lasts. <laughs> What is the vetting process like <laughs> for what goes on the yeah, menu? Like what can you also like what hasn't made the cut? Have there been oh, so many yeah. things don't make the cut? So many can things you share don't specifically? make the cut. We have 
uh, I work with uh, an awesome R&D team of three, and we're constantly vetting ideas that are so great and that we're so excited about. And we, when we have them in real life, we're like, eh. we had, we were going through the, all these like savory bread tests, and we had this amazing muffaletta bomb. Ooh, it was so good. But there was a moment we had a great samosa bomb. There were just moments where we just stopped. We had an elote bomb, like all of our favorite sandwiches or side dishes that we might like to eat. And we're just like, well, the spirit and the lens of Milk Bar is so straightforward and so like of this nostalgic place where, where something in your life, you know, doesn't change. And there's like that spirit of uh, like that, that moment of simplicity and nostalgia. And I was just like, I know what muffalette is, but maybe that's not like the beauty of Milk Bar and the menu is that it's got to be gettable. It's that's like mm -hmm. that's how we connect with our people is that it's gettable. And the second that it's not gettable or that it's over your head, I just I worry that then we lose the opportunity to connect with our food. Mm -hmm. uh, so plenty of savory bombs, a lot of soft serve flavors. Like barbecue soft serve made it on the menu Whoa. a long time ago once. No one ordered it. I uh, thought it was yeah. delicious. We wanted to do this like homage, like it's summertime. What are like the summer flavors? Um, we play around with, with a lot of different flavors and fillings and frostings. And unless it's like the thing we become obsessed about, if I can't get on stage and like talk forever about my obsession with it, yeah. if I'm not drinking the soft serve base, it's before it even goes in the machine, it doesn't make the cut. So there's like an, an element of obsession that has to exist around an idea as we start r and ding it before it makes it to the menu. If, it, if we don't obsess over it, it just doesn't make it to the menu. We can't ask you to obsess over it if we're not obsessing over it. And I think that filter is a really important part of, of the process in everything we do from the kitchen to how I run the business and the decisions I make on a daily basis. Yes, and you've got to be able to scale the item and produce yeah. it widely. Well, that's like the that's like the real life business lady problem about all of it as well. I always try and say like I'm very right brain, left brain. Um, I like majored in applied mathematics and then went to culinary school. <laughs> yeah, and I like to bring uh, my like business minded side into the kitchen where I'm naturally going to be creative, and I like to bring my creative side into the business, into the boardroom, into into the big decision-making elements of, of running the business, mm -hmm. where I'm naturally going to be a little bit more business-minded, that's my opportunity to create and vice versa. And I think that's been a real secret to my success up until this point. You bring so much optimism and, and energy to, I think, all, to your 280 employees <laughs> and to the business. What happens when you personally need to get pumped up? What do you do? Ooh. What do you turn to? Um, eating is always a great <laughs> is, is always a great pump up. Honestly, I love talking about what I do. I, I love sharing what I do. Like that just pumps me up. Like I'm I was like I'm just gonna have half a cup of coffee this morning because the second I start talking about the food that we make, yeah. I know I'm gonna like lose it in the best way possible. Um, I like to do things in my free time that make me feel like the world is weightless, like that, that, that the heft of a day of, of growing and running this awesome business, that the heft of things that are going on in the world that could very easily be like stress that you carry around on your shoulders. I like to try and find moments in every single bit of the day, especially on the weekends where I can just build in like the lightness and simplicity of life, whether it's like jumping rope or going for a bike ride or like doing the silliest mm -hmm. thing. Like when it rains, don't put a coat on, don't put shoes on, just like go out into the street and jump around. Because I think when, when, as we get older, we, we lose for some reason, we, we, we take away like the permission that we give ourselves as kids to do that. That obviously translates in, in, into mm -hmm. what I do, but it's just not worth it. Like working hard is not worth it if you're not also finding those moments to play just as hard. Yeah, that definitely shows through. And it's so and simple. It's so simple, but somehow we don't we don't create that like line of like, hey, just give yourself a moment where you're not taking yourself so seriously right this yes. second. A milk bar like our mantra when we're really like, all right, how are we gonna get you know, 100,000 cookies here to this event, or how are we going to build this store in Los Angeles? When, when it gets, like, too heavy, we're like, all right, we're just making cookies. 
Like, yeah. and the and you're bringing make joy. people happy. Yeah. And, and let's just like take it back a few notches. Let's do some jumping jacks outside. Let's go for a walk around the block and let's come back in and let's, and let's go from there. Yeah. The keeping it in perspective. Yeah. It's, it's about pleasure. Yeah. And that, and you feel that the second you walk in. Yeah. And I'm plenty something... serious of a person, yes. but I know what I need to find that balance. Yes. I think that's something you've also done so well is create this sense of community around this. It's, even the milk bar life, I know, has been a new endeavor yes. for you. Yeah, communities. It 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 literally was one of the reasons that I opened milk bar. I want a quirky bakery with a sense of community. I want people to stop in day and night. I was raised by incredible families that were all about giving back. Like it was so not like I joke with my mom that like, she only had two kids. She, like, needs 280 of my kids to be her kids. Like, that's the kind of mom she is. So giving back and, and doing good for others is really important. We started this line um, of do good, feel good food. It's all gluten-free. It's, it's, like, meant to be funny and hilariously healthy-ish because when you, like, have candy bar pie on your menu, sometimes you just need, like, a little sidestep. Um, but the reason that we also launched it and that it's called Life is because, like, it, it, every element in this gluten free line gives back to a different charity partner. We get so many requests. We're busting our butt to try and make a difference in the world. And we wanted an element of something to help make sure that while we're doing it, you can do it. Like, you can be a part of it. Like, get a BFC, which is called the best freaking cookie that's secretly good for you. Get a cookie, yeah. get a hard body juice, laugh hysterically about how it's kind of healthy, and know that in doing that, you're also giving back to Cookies for Kids Cancer or Hot Bread Kitchen or Feed or Code with Clossy or whoever our charity partner is for the quarter because it 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 makes sense if we can to us if it's worth it if we can do the most with your attention and your time and your spirit and your enthusiasm definitely and tell me about the third book <gasps> coming so out I just in the fall. turned in i know what am i do why like li so book 1 momofuku milk bar has like all of like the milk bar recipes right all of the classics Milk Bar Life, book two, was all about, like, what, we, what fuels us when we're off the clock. The third book, I just turned in the text to, it's coming out next fall, fall 2018, is called All About Cake. And it's everything from bunts and pounds, which are cake types of cakes, to hot cakes, two cupcakes if you must, because I really only make cupcakes with my nieces but I appreciate there's a time and a place, to like our most elaborate layer cake and wedding cake, to cake truffles. Um, I feel like we, nine years ago, started this revolution in the trend of, of cakes and redefining what they can be and what they should be from unfrosted on the sides to how you imagine the flavors that cake can bring. It's not just chocolate and vanilla. It can be more than that. Um, and so this cake is going to be a very spirited celebration through my lens and through the milk bar lens, all about cake. I love that. Yes. Getting back to the core. <laughs> yeah. So you, true. You've really helped define what cakes look like now. What they look yeah. like, how what? you think about what a cake filling can be. I, for me, that's like nine years of journey. If I think about like what we'll do before year 10 and in the future is continue to like challenge and challenge the world's enthusiasm about food and what food can be by doing what we do and being who we are and celebrating the things that inspire us and just continuing to create and innovate and grow and share. Definitely. Let's, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Hi. Hi. So I'm a really big fan of MasterChef, and I feel like every episode there's so many like intense and memorable moments. So I was wondering for you while filming what some of your favorite moments have been. Um, MasterChef, like every season, especially this one, is always a wild ride because we start with such a large number of home cooks, and then we start to whittle them down. And I think the moments that thrill me the most we spend a lot of time with these home cooks. We spend a lot of time with them one-on-one, -on -one, but we also spend a lot of time observing them, observing the way they think when they're in the pantry shopping for ingredients and how they think about technique and watching them from closely but from afar. It's always thrilling to me to see a cook that I see great potential in that maybe doesn't see great potential in themselves 
really start to catch on and really have like a breakthrough moment. It's usually through a dish that they they themselves aren't even sure of and they come out of like the tasting just like punching and swinging and when they finally like find that moment when they find their groove there could not be a more thrilling moment. It always bums me out when someone like trips up and falls, especially those that have really, really, really great potential. It's kind of the nature of like, honestly, the culinary industry in general, especially in the MasterChef kitchen. But those are like the greatest moments for me as a judge, as a mentor, as someone that's really invested in these home cooks. Hi. So you spoke a lot about your cookies at Milk Bar. Which one's your favorite since you have such a variety? <sighs> That's such a great and nasty question. <laughs> Honestly, my response to that would be, I don't have a fate. I have, I love each one of them for different reasons. I love the cornflake chocolate chip marshmallow cookie when it's hot out of the oven because the marshmallow is like gooey in all the right ways. I love the corn cookie as cookie dough. I have to bake it off as an operator because the health department will come after me. But if I could just serve you like literally a scoop of cookie dough, corn cookie dough in your hand, I would. Um, the Perfect 10, which is part of our lifeline, is a gluten-free cookie. And it is literally made up of almonds and almond flour. So it's basically like a power bar in a cookie. That is my favorite thing in the morning when I'm like, I want a cookie for breakfast. And then another part of me is like, you need to be a little bit more grown up this morning. <laughs> Um, when I don't want to be grown up and I want a cookie for breakfast, I always have a compost cookie because the coffee grounds in it are always like the perfect pairing with my strong cup of coffee. I could basically go on about the cookies, but <laughs> I have moments where each of them find me in a day. The blueberry and cream cookie, which something tells me is your favorite, Spivy. Sierra, yeah. is like great with my, an afternoon cup of tea. So or I write each of them a little love letter at different times of the day. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Hey. Um, I love Milk Bar. It's my favorite. I tell people about it all the time, and the corn cookie is my absolute favorite yes, on the menu. Um, I was wondering, how long does it take you to, like, perfect a recipe that gets on that menu? The, like, how long does it take to R and, like, idea to on the menu in your hands at Milk Bar is a funny process. Cereal milk, for example, nine years ago, I came up with cereal milk before I even opened the doors of Milk Bar, so let's call it 10 years ago. Literally, the recipe has not changed. I was like, this is either a really good idea or a really bad idea. I'm going to take some cornflakes. I'm going to steep them in milk and so on, and the recipe's never changed. The birthday cake, on the other hand, birthday cake and birthday truffles, it's like our thumb scratch, you know, like moment of paying homage to like that box cake mix and tub of frosting from childhood. Two years Two years it took us to perfect it. So part of it depends on how great the idea is and how it translates into food. And then the other part of it is, like, until we're obsessed with it and until it's just right, it doesn't make it on the menu. And the trickiest part about that is there kind of is no timeline. The boxes just have to be checked. Um, that provides for, a, a, like, a hilarious ride because we're like, okay, we're going to change the menu here's our timeline. But some things take four times longer than we think they'll take. Some things never make it to the menu. And some things you're like, boom, all right, put it on the menu now. Uh, but that's, the, that's kind of like the fun, wild ride of it. Every day is different. And I think you feel that when you're in the stores. Like, you feel that sort of, you know, that, like, untouchable moment of, like, why does this place feel so, like, buzzy in a fun way? And it's because we're constantly, like, moving and thinking and rejiggering and trying to make something that will be the next thing you're obsessed with. Corn cookie, though, I got you. <laughs> yeah. um, you mentioned working with Cookies for Kids Cancer. I've actually volunteered with them. Oh, um, nice. I'd love to find out how you got involved with working with them. I uh, Cookies for Kids Cancer is a non-for-profit organization that raises money for pediatric cancer research. And the money that we raise goes directly into um, specific tests. It doesn't just go to another fund that goes to another fund that then comes back in. And it's one of the most underfunded, it is the most underfunded part of, of cancer research. Um, I, for me, like my childhood uh, is what inspires me every day. The lightness of being a kid and being a child is, is when I fell in love with baking. Uh, 
So the thought that a child might not have the opportunity to have those same like impactful moments in their life purely because we're just not putting the money into the research to help support them if they fall ill. For me, it was just like an un, an unthinkable thing. I met Gretchen Holt, who's the founder of Cookies for Kids Cancer, a few years ago and um, heard amazing stories about her son and hung out with her family. And this like concept of being a good cookie and the power of what a cookie can do is is something that's like even further than I even could really wrap my head around when I opened Milk Bar. Like for me, a cookie can do so much. It can make your day an awesome day even better, a bad day great. Like that's the spirit of how I always thought the power of a cookie could really bring to a conversation and the concept of it being even more powerful for me was something that I just couldn't, I, I bonded with immediately and just couldn't walk away from. And I love doing everything I can to support that organization. Hi, um, thank you for the cookies. They were so yeah. delicious. When I, found, when I saw Confetti, them, I was like, oh my cookies. God, cookies, cool. <laughs> Um, my question is, uh, what kind of qualities are you looking for when you're judging on MasterChef? So that's a great question because a lot of home cooks think we're looking for things that we aren't on MasterChef. On MasterChef, what we're looking for are home cooks. And the home cooks that I think succeed the most in MasterChef are the home cooks that come into the kitchen with passion, with some level of culinary skill. Right? You have to have some sense of what good food tastes like and how to get from a raw ingredient to a finished dish. But more than anything, what we're looking for is potential. And what we're looking for above that is a great student. We don't expect these home cooks to come in and know everything. If they knew everything, we wouldn't be judging them, right? Like they wouldn't need the mentorship. And I think, um, especially with the adults, there's that sense as adults, we, we want to be able to prove that we can stand on our own two feet and that we know everything we have this wherewithal. But humility and being a great student and saying like, I don't know, I don't know what that ingredient is. I don't know how to use it. Teach me, show me, I wanna learn from you. Those mindsets, uh, the home cooks that have those mindsets or that get those mindsets or that are able to sort of like lower their guard enough for that uh, are the ones that are the most successful and the ones for me that I'm always looking for because they're the ones, man, like you've got Gordon Ramsay, me, and Aron Sanchez. Like, yeah, that's like three stages, three years of cooking in professional kitchens all in the MasterChef kitchen. If you can find a way to, to embrace the intensity and lower your guard and be a great student, that's, that's when a home cook really takes off and that's always what I'm looking for. Hey, growing up, who did you idolize from the culinary world? <gasps> so growing up, I baked a lot with my grandmas. They were my idols. I thought they were like, I thought, I was pretty certain that my grandmas were my best friends and I wanted to be just like them when I grew up. Um, I didn't, there wasn't a whole lot of, of like adoration in the professional uh, cooking space. I, I decided to be a professional chef uh, when I was in college. I was about to graduate college and I was like, oh, I don't want to get a real job. I don't want a real job. I don't want to like wear a suit and have this nine to five routine. I know myself well enough to know that I, my creative spirit needs to be like let loose. And that's when I really discovered the culinary industry. Um, I mean, there were always, there was always like Martha Stewart and uh, like those sort of more like females entertaining, baking, cooking in this nurturing way that that certainly caught my eye, but it wasn't until I moved to New York and went to culinary school that I like went crazy deep in like the professional chef space of, of understanding uh, what this incredible industry was built on. Great, thank you for your wonderful questions and thank you so much Yay. for being here. Thank you. Enjoy those confetti yes. cookies.